Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this lecture is for Wednesday, April 29th, and our topic for today is Christian morality. So what is the basis of Christian morality? What does it mean to act well and live well from a Christian perspective? And what do Catholic Christians, anyway, have to say about particular moral issues regarding care for the poor, protection of the vulnerable, marriage and sexuality? We'll be walking through this topic today, but I chose these pictures as the front slide, the cover slide for this lecture. The background shows um, two fields. It's an aerial view of a field of two different crops. You can see on the left there, a uh, field that is untended, uh, unsown, barren field, and on the right you see a lush field of crops. I'm not sure if that's hay or what it is, but the reason I chose this as the background is because for Christians, the question of how to act well and what it requires to live well is really a question about uh, abundance, about growth. Um, it, are we going to flourish and grow and bloom as the kind of creatures that we are, or will we be stunted in our growth? Will our lives be barren. I chose the compass, of course, because the church has some advice to direct Christians on this journey through life. And I chose the picture of the children there just because it seems to me to really express kind of what happiness and contentment is. And as we'll see, Christian morality is really all about happiness, what leads to happiness, what happiness requires, and what happiness is. Children out tending a garden is, for me, a, a particularly potent uh, symbol or embodiment of happiness. And these kids look happy there. So that's why I chose that picture. All right, so the first question we have to discuss is what morality is. What is morality? Maybe as a way into this, we can ask the sub-question, well, is everyone moral? Well, on the face of it, most people would say no. There are some immoral people, some people who aren't moral. But if you think about it a little bit, the answer to this question is really yes and no, depending on what you mean by moral, depending on what you mean by morality. In one sense, everyone has a morality. But in another sense, not everyone is morally good. And what I mean by that first statement is that there's a sense in which Every moral code is moral in the sense that it guides action, but in another sense, and this gets to the second statement, not every moral code is moral in the sense of morally good. So the first observation really comes from the fact that humans act for ends. People do what they do for particular reasons. You might not think that brushing your teeth is a moral act. It's not really subject to a lot of ethical controversy, but nevertheless, if you have a reason to brush your teeth, if you do it for a specific reason and you do it intentionally, as opposed to say, brushing your teeth in your sleep, then it's a moral act. Why? Because you have a reason for doing it. It's a conscious act. It's an intentional act. It's ordered to some end and I think it's fairly uncontroversial that it's a morally good act because it's ordered to the end of keeping your teeth clean, which is ordered to the end of keeping your teeth healthy, which is ordered to the further end of keeping your body healthy. A lot of people in olden days died from infections uh, as a result of rotting teeth, and so it's good to have that dental hygiene, right, to preserve your overall health. This boy looks like my son when he's brushing his teeth. My son likes to spread the toothpaste around and pretend like he's shaving, which is kind of annoying, but 
So in this sense, every act is moral if it's done intentionally for a specific reason. If it's linked in with human rationality, it's linked in with morality. Morality is really coextensive with rational action. But in another sense, every reason that you act is not necessarily morally good. So is every end for which you act morally good? Well, probably not. Right? It would be an extreme position to say any reason for acting is a good reason for acting. And a bank robber could rob a bank very intentionally with a specific end in mind. Usually bank robbers do have a specific end in mind, namely get the money to increase one's wealth. And the question though is, is this a, a good act just because it's intentional, just because it's uh, an action for a specific end? Again, it's pretty uncontroversial. Most people would say no. That's kind of a standard example, right, of uh, an immoral action, theft by force. So on the one hand, you have what's called descriptive morality. And descriptive morality is just describing why people act the way they do. Everyone lives in a certain way, and so everyone acts according to a certain code of conduct that explains their actions. And the explanation for any person's actions involve ends. So what are they acting for? What are they hoping to achieve? What are their ultimate goals and aims? It also involves means, though, because every action, even if it has a goal, there may be different ways of achieving that goal. So the means are the specific ways that a person seeks the specific ends that they're seeking, uh, that, that they're trying to attain. So say the bank robber wants to give money to people who are poor or oppressed. That's a good aim. That's a good goal. But perhaps the means by which he does that can come into question. You know, maybe it's justified if the uh, system uh, in which they're acting is oppressive enough. And that brings up really the third element of any kind of description of an action, namely the circumstances. So what's the situation? Uh, why are they acting is one question. How are they acting is another question. But what's the context or setting for their action would be a third question that would really help to reveal uh, what specific act is, is going on there. And all of these, notice, you can specify without specifying whether the action is good or not. Now, you will need to describe these actions in order to make an evaluation of an act. At least for standard Christian morality, all of these three aspects of the act have to be good for the action to be good. You have to have a good aim or goal, a good end in mind, and you have to try to bring about that good end through a good action. Uh, the means for seeking that end has to be good, and it has to be good in light of the circumstances um, of the action. So all of these three together can produce rules. And rules are really the substance of a moral code. If X, then do Y in order to achieve Z. This is the basic structure for any kind of code of conduct and therefore the basic structure of what we could call descriptive morality. But there's also prescriptive morality, or what sometimes is called normative morality. And this is where we get into the evaluation of moral acts as good or bad. Not all codes of conduct are the same. That seems pretty obvious. Some are better than others. Maybe a little more controversial there. But I think most people would um, grant that. But why would that be the case? Well, you could say one code of conduct is better than another because it's more effective, it's more efficient. Uh, so this is focusing more on the means and circumstances. If you have a particular aim or goal in mind and you take it for granted that it's good, then you could quibble about whether or not a certain code of conduct is the best way to bring about that end in the particular circumstances in which you find yourself. But there's also the dimension of normativity. 
Uh, and it's just as a fancy word for moral norms, like what you should do, not what you in fact do and how you do it, but, but what you should do, whether what you're doing is actually something good. And this necessarily brings in the dimension of the ends or the goals of moral action. So at least for traditional morality and for Christian morality in particular, uh, the, there's a premise that some actions make us better. Some actions you do and it enhances your life, it makes you a better person, and some actions don't. Some actions lead to better ends than others, another way of putting it. So is there a best or a highest goal or end? This is perhaps the most controversial question in terms of uh, fundamental moral theory. Is there some specific end for human action toward which all of our actions should be directed? Or is there a collection of such ends? Well, one way of getting into this question is to talk about a parable or a didactic story from Plato's book. And this story really reveals the two rival paradigms of morality that Sri touches upon in his chapter. A morality that seeks ends for oneself alone, a me for me type of paradigm, or actions that are done for the sake of one's relationship to others and one's own place in a particular community. A me for us morality, you might say. So we'll, we'll see what this is about as we go along here, but Plato presents this story in his Republic called the, the Ring of Gyges Parable, and it was a, a well-known story of the time. And it's a thought experiment as well. And uh, it, it, it's based on the idea that a farmer, a poor farmer, finds a ring in the field and the ring makes him invisible. And so now that he can put on this ring, and that may sound familiar to you if you know the Lord of the Rings stories. That's why I put the ring of power there. That was the, This story was actually somewhat of an inspiration to J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings. If you had a ring like this, if you put it on, it made you disappear and you were no longer visible to anybody else, how would you act? Would this change how you act? How would this change your moral code of conduct? Well, the antagonist in this story, he's a, uh, so it's basically a conversation between Socrates on the one hand and this guy Glaucon on the other hand. And he's representative of a sort of pure power-based morality. He says, really, the just is the strongest. That's what justice means. Justice means being stronger than another. And so if I had this ring, I would act just to get what I want. And I'd be able to get it more readily because I wouldn't have to negotiate other people. Nobody could stop me. So he actually commends the person in the parable, the farmer, who, upon finding this ring, uh, kills the king, seduces the queen, and basically becomes the ultimate ruler. He makes himself as powerful as he could using this new means of um, acting without being seen. Now Socrates pushes back and says, if I had this ring, I would act the way that I acted before. I would act according to the dictates of justice. So they have this debate about, well, why? Why would you follow any moral rules if you didn't have to? If you could get what you want, uh, without any resistance, then why would you still abide by these uh, strictures, these social conventions that limit people's ability to get what they want? So it raises the question, why not just take what we want? Is it really a fear of punishment? So we act morally just because there are rules that are enforced out there? Or do we act the way we do because we're seeking some good to come from it? We're trying to become a particular type of person. So if you really think justice is the way to be happiest in this life, then the ring doesn't really make much of a difference, right? This is what Socrates would say. <clears throat> justice is, in a sense, its own reward because it's the way to be happiest in this life. It's what leads to the greatest uh, amount of well-being. 
So this uh, dispute between Socrates and Glaucon reveals two fundamentally different types of morality. There's a morality uh, the, of obligation that sees moral rules as primarily a kind of compromise. So here's a bunch of things that I want, you want them too. Uh, instead of just going out and um, fighting and one of us will die, let's invent these moral rules so that we'll get as much as possible given the presence of the other and the interests of the other. So this morality is really just about navigating the obstacles that are, that are out there to maximizing one's own good. And uh, instead of having no rules at all, which is kind of a gamble because well, maybe you'll come out the winner in the, in the dispute, but maybe you won't. So why don't we both compromise and we'll guarantee that uh, each of us gets at least some of what we want. But notice the mentality behind this way of looking at morality. It presumes that I do what I do for me. Uh, and this is sort of the fundamental posture of a moral agent. Everybody is seeking to get the most for themselves and others are just simply in the way. I'm the main character of the story, others are supporting cast, and they play a role in my life only to the extent that they uh, facilitate my well-being or hinder my well-being. And so morality is a way of negotiating these other people that are involved in my life. But the ultimate goal, really, of human action is to get the most of what I want for myself. So this would be the me-for-me me paradigm of morality. And you're moral because it's really in your best interest to be moral, given that everybody else is out for themselves as well. So morality is really an obligation. If you had a way to get around it, you would. If you had a ring of power, then morality would be superfluous. It would be obsolete. Socrates' perspective, though, is what you might call a morality of happiness. And it sees morality as a kind of roadmap leading to a specific destination. And the moral rules and guides that typically structure human society get us to this final goal. And it's really about getting to the goal that these rules of this code of conduct is meant to facilitate that morality is all about. And we need each other to get there. And that's why justice is important. I give you what you are owed not because it's in my own best interest, but because I need you in order to realize fully my own potential. So I not only do what I do for myself, I do what I do for us as a group. So happiness is really about right relationship. That is, in fact, what happiness is. And justice is what orders right relationship. And so if I want to be really happy, then justice is the roadmap that's going to get me to that form of happiness. And so we can really only be happy together. Uh, I can't be happy without you. You can't be happy without me. So it's a collaborative effort. So this is why Socrates would say, even if I had the ring of power, I would still need to make sure that not only am I getting what I need to be happy, but you are getting what you need because I need you to achieve happiness. All right, so with that, all that in mind, we can get into the Shri chapter for today, which is chapter 14, A Catholic Moral Worldview. And we'll eventually get into chapter 15 as well. So Shri begins his two chapters with the observation that we are made for happiness. He writes, this is what Catholic morality is really all about, the quest for happiness. Well, that sounds nice, but why is that the case? What's behind that claim? Well, behind that claim is the central claim of the Catholic faith, which he specifies early on in the book. The Catholic Church stands for the God who is madly in love with you, who has a plan for you and wants you to be happy. So God loves us and wants us to be happy. And so Catholic morality is really an outgrowth of that claim. The Catholic Church teaches what it does in order to facilitate happiness because this is what God intends for us, and God intends this for us because he loves us. So that's the logic there. Now you might say, well, what evidence is there that God loves us and wants us to be happy? 
Well, Benjamin Franklin said, beer is proof. That's, that was almost his exact words. Beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. But happiness should involve more than beer, though. For most, most people recognize that. God wills our good for his own, for our own sake. So this is what it means to say that God loves us. God wills what is good for us, not because it's good for him, but because it's good for us. God wills the good of the other for the sake of the other. And so that means that God is willing the good for us. What is the highest good? What does it mean for God to will the good? Well, the highest good that's out there is God himself. So in a sense, what God wills for us, for our sake, is nothing but himself. And what is God? Love. God is, in fact, agape, this self-giving, absolute, unconditional love. And so this is really what happiness consists in for human beings. The love that God himself is and that God reveals himself to be through Jesus Christ. So that means we are only happy to the extent that we are able to love. This is Sri's next main uh, move here, his next inference. And one way of fleshing this out is to say that we are made for friendship. And this goes all the way back to Aristotle, of course he was not a Christian. It's a kind of perennial human reality. The friendship is one of the highest, greatest goods, and without friendship, uh, happiness really isn't possible. Well, this flows really nicely into the Christian logic of who God is and who we are and what God wills for us. And so, from the Christian perspective, this friendship, this ability to love, involves friendship both with God and with others. So, unlike Aristotle, who thought friendship with God was just sort of a silly notion, Christians both include others, other people, and also God in the human vocation to love. Sri writes, we are therefore made for friendship, to live like the Trinity, giving ourselves in love to others. Okay, so the next topic, the next major dimension of Christian reality is freedom. So human action, if it's to be human, if it's to be rational, must be free. Meaning, it must be undetermined. Um, not determined in advance. So we're not robots. We're not pre-programmed. And that means that our actions are, in a sense, self-directed. We can act one way, or we can act another way. And only if there's this indeterminacy in our action can we really say, it is I who act. I'm the one who is doing what I'm doing. It's not some external factor. It's not some program that was implanted in me. My actions, in a sense, belong to me. They are expressions of me, my intention, my choice. Well, in addition to this, human freedom also means that, in a sense, I am what I do. My actions manifest my intentions. They are sort of the external manifestations of my rationality and intention in the world. And further than that, my actions, in a sense, make me the person that I am. They have a reciprocal effect. I choose my actions, but in a sense, my actions then go on to shape the person that I am. So this is, an, this is what freedom is really for, and it is an essential requirement for human action. But what is freedom ordered to? Why do we even have the ability to choose actions freely? Well, there's a sense of freedom being a kind of negative quality. We are free from something. This is what might be called freedom from. And this is what allows us to choose for ourselves. This negative freedom refers to a sphere of immunity from coercion. So we're not forced from outside to act one way as opposed to another. We have a kind of space for our own choice. We have the freedom to choose for ourselves what to do. 
and famous uh, British philosopher Isaiah Berlin had a great essay called uh, The Fox and the Hedgehog, where he compared these two understandings of freedom. And he called this negative freedom hedgehog freedom because it's the freedom that keeps outside forces, outside influences away. So it's not a good idea to go up and try to hug a hedgehog or a porcupine in the case of North Americans. Why? Because they have these spikes or these quills precisely to keep predators away, to keep others away. And they can go about and do what they do and waddle around because they have this sphere of immunity provided by <clears throat> these quills. So you could think of freedom in that way as that which gives us the space to make decisions for ourselves, what allows choice to happen in the first place. But there's another sense of freedom that Sri really emphasizes that has a positive valence to it. This is what you might call freedom for. This freedom refers to a capacity to perform actions well. Specifically, the ability to pursue and achieve goods that are difficult, that require the cultivation of skills. So one can be free to speak Russian or not to speak Russian. One can be free to play a list uh, rhapsody or not. Just wanting to perform an action of this sort is not sufficient. Merely intending to do so does not give you the freedom to actually go ahead and do so. So this is why Isaiah Berlin calls this the freedom of the fox. Right? Because the fox not only can direct his own actions, but has the capacity to do things that the hedgehog cannot. Foxes are notoriously cunning animals, and so they have a capacity to act in ways that other animals do not. So notice that this is kind of an active, dynamic notion of freedom. Freedom that is meant to be used and applied in certain ways, given capacities that have been cultivated. And Sri will come to side most definitively with the positive sense of freedom. Now, it's important to note that the negative dimension of freedom is a kind of uh, necessary requirement for the exercise of freedom, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. It's only when we ask, well, why are we free? For what purpose are we free? To what end are we free that we can then give a full account of what freedom actually is. And we can appreciate this maybe by um, reflecting on the fact that our freedom grows only when we use it rightly. Sri will write this. Oh no, this is actually St. Paul, sorry, in his uh, letter to the Galatians. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What does he mean by that? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So Christ has set us free. So we have a, a kind of um, freedom from a state of bondage or slavery. But now, how are you going to use that freedom? Are you going to use it to make yourself more free? St. Paul's exhortation here is basically saying, don't use your freedom to submit again to slavery. Uh, I think it's a basic psychological fact that we can freely choose to do things that make us less free. Uh, every time you give in to an addiction, you're making it harder and harder to resist that addiction in the future. You are, in a sense, becoming less free by choosing to perform certain actions and to the point where you can become physically dependent. Uh, or psychologically dependent and that is a, a kind of constraint that wasn't there before and it comes about as a result of your own free actions so freedom should be thought of more like a muscle than a light switch it isn't just simply this binary on off type of quality it's something that grows with right use and that atrophies with uh, poor use or misapplication 
Okay, so this gets us into the next dimension of Christian morality for Sri, <clears throat> virtue. So if you have an understanding of freedom as both a capacity to determine and direct one's actions, and then also a sense that, well, there's a specific way in which that indeterminacy should be directed in order to preserve it and to allow it to grow, what does this freedom actually look like? What does this right direction or right use of freedom actually look like? Well, it should be more than just skill alone. So a master assassin or a master criminal <clears throat> can do things I can't. He is free to do things that I am unable to do. And in some cases, great evil requires great skill. Right? The um, masterminds of the 9-11 attacks were more skillful in certain ways than I am or than most people are. Uh, people like Hitler have certain skills that they use their freedom for. And not everybody has the capacity for that sort of action. But does that itself make it good? Just because it's a highly developed skill that not very many people can perform, does that alone make it something good? Does that alone uh, reveal a good use of freedom? Well, no. Freedom can be developed, skills can be developed that direct one in a good, right direction, or a bad, negative direction. True freedom for the Christian is the strength to love, the skills necessary for love. I take this phrase, the strength to love, from Martin Luther King. It's the title of one of his best known books, and I just love it. I think it's a, a wonderful phrase. Usually we think of love as either an emotion or a kind of capitulation to um, some power beyond us. We usually don't think of it in terms of strength or power, but love is a kind of strength. It's a kind of power that requires exercise, that requires cultivation. So love requires not just feeling something, but actually developing certain skills or capacities, just like learning the piano or learning Russian. So we must learn to love well. It isn't an innate instinct. The skills that we need to do that are called the virtues. So this is what virtue is. It's a habitual disposition to act in ways that perfect us, that make us tend to act promptly and with pleasure in ways that make us better, that make us who we were meant to be. To the extent that I lack virtue, I am not free to love. <clears throat> so this connects uh, the idea that uh, true freedom is the ability to love. This requires skill. And so to the extent that I lack the skills to love, I am not free to perform that activity. Sri goes on to write, true freedom is not merely the ability to make choices. It's found in the ability to consistently make good choices, virtuous choices that enable us to live our relationships with excellence. So for Christians, Jesus embodies this strength to love. He is a exemplar of the virtues because he shows the perfection of this capacity. And notice that this changes how we might understand freedom and happiness. We might ask, well, if Jesus is the most perfect human and the greatest moral example, is he really uh, an embodiment of freedom in its greatest extent? Is he really the freest person that ever lived? Is he really the happiest person who ever lived? He doesn't seem very happy at the end of his life anyway, dying as he did. Well, this is revealing about the nature of happiness and therefore the nature of freedom for Christians. Jesus embodies human perfection because he embodies the perfection of love. So unlike Achilles for Homer and the Greeks, his perfection isn't a perfection of power or prowess self-sufficiency, self-determination. It's the perfection of the human capacity for love. Okay, so this love isn't something that's kind of abstract and ephemeral. It isn't just merely subjective, the product of the human mind. 
there's a deep moral realism to this uh, way of looking at uh, human morality. If we seed, if we um, admit that some actions really are better than others, <clears throat> then we have to admit that some lives really are better than others because some lives are characterized by actions that are better than lives that are characterized by other actions. And so there's a way of actually evaluating the goodness of an action and the goodness of a life based on this criterion of human happiness and human freedom and human love. So if the ultimate criterion of human morality is love, then some acts will facilitate love and some will not. Now it's common in our culture just to think, well, acts are good if they're freely chosen and they don't hurt anybody. So if two people are involved in an action and they both freely choose to perform that action, then there's nothing wrong with it, right? It's not hurting anybody. Everyone's agreeing to cooperate and perform this action together. Moreover, there's the presumption that maybe it's consensus. So if enough people think an action is good, then that makes that action good. So this might be the, if enough people vote for a certain type of uh, law, a certain type of uh, convention, custom, then it must be good. But the moral realism of the Christian perspective rules this out. Consent alone can't really make an act good, nor can consensus. Why? Well, take the example of a German guy by the name of Armin Maivez, who was kind of a secretly, um, he was a sort of secret uh, cannibal, or at least aspiring to be in cannibals, the dream of his life to eat another human person. And this happened about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And he looked online to see if anybody else shared his uh, fetish. And he happened to find somebody whose lifelong dream was to be eaten by another person. So he linked up with this guy and they eventually agreed to work out an arrangement where he would eat the person who wanted to be eaten. And so this was weird instance of consensual cannibalism that happened in Germany. They actually like wrote out a contract, <clears throat> they signed the contract, and then they carried out their intentions. And does that mean that this action is okay? What's wrong with it? If they both agreed that this is what they wanted to do, they gave their full consent. Even the German courts at the time didn't really know what to do with it because there was this underlying presumption that, well, if two people agree to it, it's not really harming either one. <coughs> if somebody says, well, you know, this is really what I want. This is what is good for me. This is what's fulfilling for me to be eaten by this other guy. Uh, then who am I to say that that's wrong? But of course, it's uh, such an extreme example and it flies in the face of uh, what most people presume to be wrong, namely murder and cannibalism, that they actually had to figure out a way in the German law courts to rule this out. Uh, but they did so on the basis really of consensus, that this was such a strongly shared conviction in society that one person killing another, even if they want to be killed, is wrong. One person eating another person just because they want to be eaten, no, that doesn't make it right that we'll pass a law because enough people in our society think that that's really the case. But what if enough people in a society thought that it was okay? Would that make it okay? Well, take the instance of slavery. Even in our own country, we had places where there was a very strong consensus that slavery was fine, that it was morally permissible, uh, that it was kind of in, in the nature of things, that some people should be slaves to others. And uh, even in the past hundred years, uh, there had to be a way to resist the kind of common consensus that a certain uh, race was inferior to another race, that this can't really, this, this uh, moral fact cannot just be simply put to a popular vote, can't be left up merely to the majority of people. Why? Because even if the majority of people think that it's right or okay, uh, it's not. So this is really what moral realism is. 
no matter whether you have uh, consent or mutual agreement upon a certain act, no matter how many people in a particular society think that a particular action is okay, that that doesn't necessarily itself make it okay. So we might ask, well, why can't I do what I want if it doesn't hurt anyone else? That doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, if I'm free to do what I want, then why is it a problem if it's not affecting anybody? Well, the problem with that is that it really does. And at the very deepest level, it's affecting you. It's affecting yourself. So ask yourself this question. So there are pedophiles out there, and maybe a way to address their potential harm to other people is to give them child sex dolls, right? So that they can, you know, perform these uh, disordered, perverted actions that they want to perform on their own, right? And they won't hurt anybody. They'll just have this doll. They actually make a doll now called Frigid Farah, who is a sex doll that's meant to <clears throat> resist the person who is, you know, trying to do what they want to do with it. Uh, and it's meant to simulate rape for people who f have a preference for that. Now, if nobody's getting hurt by this, uh, is it still okay? Well, I hope that it should at least be somewhat disturbing uh, to most people, and I think it is. And it raises the question then, well, what do we do with this principle? It seems so reliable. If it's not hurting anyone else, then isn't it okay? Isn't it fine to do? We might also think of like virtual reality video games that maybe involve murder. Maybe this can be a way to divert serial killers from actually killing other real people. But hopefully these examples show you that even if you say, well, we can't outlaw these things, that they're not morally good. Why? Well, they're not hurting anybody else, but they're at least making the person who performs these actions both worse in themselves and also more dangerous or volatile for other people, right? To um, indulge in um, a simulation of harm is going to make you more apt or prone to carry out that harmful action outside your own space. Every action that you perform, whether you're by yourself or with other people, it trains you for future actions, which will either help or hurt the others around you. So no matter how many people are around or how many people your particular action hurts, it's forming you to be the sort of person that will be helpful or hurtful to other people. So the bottom line is that love is a, a real thing that's out there in the world. It's not just an emotion. It's not a purely subjective thing. It's an activity. It's an achievement. It's a kind of dance. You can't really participate in a dance unless you know how to do it. You can't really participate in, in, in the same dance with other people unless they also know how to do it. It's a common reality that's outside of both of you that you share in together and this is how Christians think of love as something real out there in the world that you either are in tune with that you know how to do or something that you're not in tune with that you don't know how to do and in order to engage in it you have to learn the skills that are necessary to do it all right well going off of this um, moral realism is based on the idea that love is real so we're tapping into a reality that is beyond ourselves. And for Christians, this reality is ultimately love. So God is love. Love is, in a sense, the ultimate reality. St. Paul will say in his first letter to the Corinthians, love never ends. So love is infinite. And it isn't just a nice poetic phrase, and it isn't even simply based in one's own subjective experience, that when I love something, then that feeling kind of never goes away. It's really that love is a reality that's out there, and it's ultimate, and it's infinite. So it's something that we encounter in the world, and Christians at least ascribe this reality that we encounter to God himself. So love is itself the infinite. Love is the ultimate reality that's out there, which means that when we're living well, when we're acquiring and cultivating the skills to love, 
We are, in a sense, acting in an accord with the deepest current of reality that's out there. But this reality isn't just simply indeterminate. It's not something that is um, up for uh, indefinite interpretation. God's love must be our reference point for what love really is. So we only really know what love is and that love is really possible because God's love has been made real in our lives through Jesus Christ. This is the Christian perspective. This is what allows us to know what love is. Because otherwise, our definitions of love could vary uh, widely. They could be opposites, even. What love is for me is something opposite and contrary to what love is for you. Maybe to love somebody is to kill them. Well, that would seem to be kind of the opposite of love, or at least contrary, mutually exclusive with what most people think love is. Christians have a common reference point to define what love is because God has loved us and has revealed his love for us and revealed that he himself is love through Jesus Christ. So it's really through Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross that we can come to know what love is and therefore to know what the deepest reality is that's out there. And it also has the function of preventing us from hesitating to love because we're afraid of being used or exploited. Uh, and some feminist thinkers uh, critique the Christian understanding of love and Christian morality generally on these grounds, that it's encouraging people to give themselves to others, to be vulnerable to others, uh, and this can lead to kind of exploitation. It can lead to codependence. So you can offer yourself to another and they can just simply use you, right? They can consume you, and you're basically just uh, offering fuel to another person's pathology at that point. But this is uh, why Christians would say only the reality of God's love can prevent this. Only the reality of God's love can prevent our attempts at love from devolving into exploitation. Again, it's entering into a current. And so if you offer love, and that love doesn't sort of blossom forth into a mutual giving and receiving, then what's being manifested there isn't really the love that God is. It really isn't true love. Uh, it's uh, something else, codependence, exploitation. All right, well, if we've gotten this far, we might ask, well, what are some examples? What does Christian love actually look like? If to live well means to love, how does one do so? This is where we get into chapter 15, really. The first thing to observe, though, uh, and is based in uh, the moral realism of Christian morality, is that love is concrete. It has a concrete shape to it. It's a reality that's out there. It's not dependent upon my understanding of it. Nevertheless, though, we can identify it. We can point to instances of it. It's a reality in the world that we can identify. And so we can, we can differentiate between its authentic and counterfeit forms. There's lots of things out there that claim to be love. Uh, lots of actions that uh, purport to be loving. But Christian morality, insofar as it's based in a, a realism, it, it tries to differentiate between what's authentic and real, and what's not, what's counterfeit. And that means that love has particular requirements. So if love is something real in the sense objective, then it's going to have a, a particular requirements that differentiate it from other, other actions. It's like a dance, and you have to learn the steps. And if you don't learn the steps, then you're not really engaging in that dance. If you don't know how to tango, somebody can try to tango with you, but the result would not in fact be the tango. And like food or medicine, since it's objective, it can have effects on us even if we don't completely understand how. And this is why that you, this is really how you can love children. And this is why loving children is so important because it's not only the uh, exchange and reciprocity of subjective feelings and attachments that makes up love. 
it's a reality that's manifested in the world that has specific effects. And even if we don't completely understand how it has those effects, just like we may not know why particular food nourishes us and keeps us alive or why particular medicine heals us or relieves our symptoms, uh, we know that it has this effect and it has this effect objectively, whether we appreciate that effect or not. So when Mother Teresa feeds, feeds a poor person, like in that picture, the love that she's manifesting is just as real as the food. And the love is having just as real an effect upon that child as the food is having. All right, so some manifestations, what this love actually looks like in the world. First of all, Sri talks about care for the poor in chapter 15. For Christians, helping those most in need is not something that's optional. It's a requirement for our salvation. When someone asked Mother Teresa how she would uh, present the gospel, she said, I like to present the gospel with my five fingers. And she says, one word per finger, you did it to me, which she gets from the 25th chapter of Matthew, which is a parable about the last judgment. How does God differentiate between the good and the evil, those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous? The criterion is whether someone has helped another in need. And if they've done so, it's as if they have done it to God himself. And the implication of that is that in aiding the poor and caring for the poor, we meet God. So this is the locus, the privileged locus, where Christians encounter God in the world, and it's where they work out their salvation. So in giving food to the hungry, and giving drink to the thirsty, and clothing the naked, you're not only doing it to the person who needs these things, you're doing it to Christ himself. And the flip side of that is when we abandon the poor, we abandon God. So our relationship with God is dependent upon our relationship with others, and it really serves as a real uh, wedge between whether we are in right relationship with God or not. Two quotes that he brings up here are very powerful from church fathers. The first is from St. Gregory the Great, who says, when we give the poor what they need, we really just give them what is theirs. So we shouldn't think of it in terms of we're doing something that's morally um, over and above what's expected of us. It's a matter of justice. What, is, what, they, what the poor require is theirs according to the dictates of justice. And if we, especially if we have more than we need, when we give them the basics that they require, we're just giving them what is theirs by right. St. John Chrysostom uh, expresses the obverse of this insight, that not to share one's wealth with the poor is in fact to steal from them. This is a very radical claim, but it's one the church has uh, taken to heart. It's one that the church has really owned and continually presented over the years. And so if you look in your closet and you see an extra coat in there, see an extra pair of shoes that you never wear, uh, are you really stealing those from somebody who might need them? Regardless of the particular case, the principle is that the poor require certain basic goods, and that giving these basic goods is giving them what is theirs, because they are made in the image of God. But the poor not only need our assistance, they not only need material goods, they require most of all human presence. So Sri, Sri will say that we're called to share more than just our wealth. We're called to give of ourselves. And here he appeals to Pope Francis, who talks about uh, creating a culture of encounter when we come into contact with the poor, when we seek to help the poor, do we just hand something out to them? And even if we don't personally encounter the poor, are we just helping the poor by writing a check or making a few clicks to support a cause? Pope Francis would say, you don't really encounter the poor unless you're personally present to them. He even says, unless you touch the person, you don't really encounter them. I'm not sure I would go that far, but uh, the point is that you're not only meant to offer what you have from a position of superiority, you're meant to be with them. 
you're meant to close this gap that makes them them as opposed to one of us uh, so the greatest gift that we can offer to the poor is not just goods not just material things but our friendship and it's really this friendship that takes somebody who's in great need and incorporates them into the community into the human community and makes them one of us on the same level and that's really the the ultimate end so the next topic of chapter 15 then is really issues of life the broad principle i would say here is that love is life giving love gives life and this connects very naturally from what christians believe about creation that god's love brings everything into existence and this is the love that underlies all love god's love agape but the love that we show in the world also should give life it's an imitation of god's creative life-giving love and we do this through our friendships so even the ancients recognized that friendship is what makes life worth living and this is the love of philia or the love between friends but there's also spousal friendship so the love between friends is one thing the love between spouses is something different in kind uh, biologically of course uh, and uh, in terms of how their bodies are related to one another and the commitment that those uh, that friendship involves but marriage spousal friendship brings new life into existence quite literally but it's important to recognize at the same time that marriage is a species of friendship it's a species of love so if God's love is agape and friendship love is philia the erotic love that's the basis of marriage is called eros but this marital love gives rise to a family and gives rise then to familial love the love that siblings brothers aunts uncles grandparents grandchildren share with one another and this also is different somewhat in kind from the love of friendship it's the greek word for this is storge so there's different types of love they have the same thing in common though they are sources of life sources of life in the metaphysical sense in terms of god love god's love sources of qualitative life life in the fullest in terms of friendship sources of biological life and familial uh, existence or marriage and then sources of familial unity and the common life of a family in terms of storge so what characterizes marriage well marriage is really about two main ends there's there's two principal goals or ends or aims of marriage and the first and foremost is that of communion so two people share life with each other they live a common life together and in doing so they share their whole selves everything about them Himes did a good job of emphasizing this point in marriage two people off to offer to one another everything that they are and they live a life in common where their their well-being is in a sense mutually um, implicated mutually uh, extensive the other end of marriage though is procreation and you know this links up with just the biology of uh, mammalian mating right it's two uh, people um, come together and engage in a certain activity and that this common activity then gives rise to offspring but with human beings this is meant to occur in the context of the communion of marriage because if human beings bear God's image then human life should emerge from the love that we ourselves reflect the love of God so humans should be loved into existence just as everything in the world is loved into existence the love between spouses creates others to love love gives way to more love uh, a multi-dimensional kind of expansion and um, this is uh, reminiscent of an old theological um, 
saying that uh, the good is diffusive of itself, bonum diffusivum sui. So what is good naturally expands, and the love between spouses naturally expands into the love of children, the love between children, the love of children for parents. So communion and procreation are the two ends of marriage. But marriage is characterized by three requirements, or three main dimensions of marital friendship. What makes a marriage a true marriage? First, the first one she mentions is commitment, where one person says, I give my whole self to you. And then the other person reciprocates and says, I give my whole self to you. So you have this mutual commitment, which is in a sense unlimited. And that this commitment is exclusive. I give my whole self to you and only to you. So it's a communion between two individuals. And it also has the dimension of permanence, that this exclusive commitment is meant to pertain until death. So this is reflective of the standard marriage vows, uh, where they say, um, I will be there for you. I commit myself to you. I promise to live this common life with you and only with you until death do us part. All right, so if marriage is a sort of way that um, we see that love gives life, love is also at the service of life. So it isn't just enough that it brings about life. It has to also protect life. So we must not only aid those in need, but protect them. And above all, we must protect the most vulnerable, those who cannot defend themselves. And this includes the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized, so those without resources to defend themselves, those who find themselves uh, discriminated against. But Sri also mentions that it applies to the unborn, who are perhaps the most defenseless and vulnerable in our society. So if love is always at the service of life, it's going to protect that life and it's going to facilitate the necessities of that life uh, despite the condition of the person and the threats that the person may be facing. So there's a kind of um, courage that comes with love. Again, if, if love is about a certain capacity or strength, then there's something that seeks to preserve the conditions for that reality in the world. And for Catholics at least, the unborn are already part of the human community. You have a human person uh, growing in the womb and they require love even before they come to, into the world, even before they're aware of their surroundings and can form their own interests. So the Christian vocation ultimately is to bring love into the world especially where love is lacking. Love is really the solution to all of the social wrongs, all the dysfunctions and pathologies in the world. And it's also what perfects the human person. It's really the purpose we were created. So there's really no problem, issue, or evil in the world that love can't apply itself to and that love can't overcome. So we might change the old Latin motto, amor omnia vincit, to agape omnia vincit. This is the underlying Christian conviction that love can solve any problem. Or to adapt the lyrics of a country song that my daughter likes to listen to, there ain't nothing that love can't fix. The song itself says beer, but um, it's really love. Love is the ultimate solution to our problems, and love is the ultimate end of our vocation as human beings, and should be the end of every action, and the criterion for evaluating our actions in the world. Okay, so that's it for today, and I will uh, see you guys perhaps in the live Zoom group discussion meetings. And we'll be back again with another lecture for Friday. So hope you have a good day.